All right. So John chapter 11, last week we looked at where uh, Jesus had waited until Lazarus had died. The some of the Jews had come to come to comfort the siblings, Martha and Mary, because of Lazarus dying. And it appears that some of them, well, I'm not sure that any of them were this time. We'll see later that some of them did become believers and some yes, of them did not. And uh, so we saw Martha when she heard that Jesus was there. She quietly slipped away and went out to, to meet him. And she she said, Lord, if, said, said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And said, but even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will, will give it to you. And Jesus said, your brother will, shall rise again. And said, I know he will in the in the at the last day, at the resurrection on the last day, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me shall live, even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall, shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said, well, yes, Lord. I said, I have believed that you are the Christ. You're the son of God, the one who's coming into the world, and when she said that, then she went and called Mary, and she did it kind of secretly, kind of whispered, probably because of the, the Jews that were there, because she didn't know whether they were going to be hostile to Jesus or or if they were going to be uh, receptive. And they knew, probably most likely knew that, that the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees had been wanting to kill Jesus. So she quietly went to Mary and said, the teacher's looking for you, he's calling for you. And when she, when she heard that right away, she rose quickly and went out, rushed out to see him. And And the Jews that were there, she she didn't make any attempt to, to be quiet about it. They saw her going and they assumed that she was going to the tomb to, to weep for her brother Lazarus. And when, when she saw, she, when she came to where Jesus was, she saw him right, right away, she fell at his feet and said the exact same thing, words that, Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And that's about where we finished off last time. So we saw, we looked a little bit at Mary last time, her faith. And we, we looked at Luke chapter 10, where Mary and Martha, they're, they're different. You see, they have different personalities. Um, Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha was was busy, distracted with much serving. She was worried and troubled over the much serving, and Jesus kind of rebuked her and said, "You know, Martha, you're you're troubled over these things. You're worried, and you know your sister Mary has chosen the better part, and it's not going to be taken away away from her." And so, let's we'll take a look a little bit more at Mary today. We looked talked about her a little bit last time, and one of the questions. That, it came up, I believe it was Kim that asked the question, you know, we, we see that Mary is often sitting at Jesus's feet. And the question was, you know, what, what exactly does that mean to sit at Jesus' feet? And we kind of threw some ideas around. And I think the one thing in, in Luke 10, when she was sitting at Jesus' feet, she was sitting at his feet to learn from him. It says that she was listening to his word. So he was teaching she was sitting at his feet, learning from him. And in Acts, Acts, what chapter was that? Acts uh, 22. 22. Yeah, in Acts 22, Paul says that Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, so that was, he was learning from Gamaliel sitting at his feet. So in both these cases, it looks like sitting at someone's feet means that you're learning from them. You're, you're a disciple of that person. You're absorbing everything he has to teach. Um, so that, that'd be one of the aspects of sitting, sitting at his feet. Um, anybody have any other thoughts, anything that was revealed to you this past week? It could also be an act of worship. We, we see in, uh, in Matthew 28, we can look at this a little more when we get to the, the resurrection. But after the resurrection, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, I don't know if that would have included um, Mary, this Mary of Bethany, they right away they they grasped, they fell at Jesus' feet and worshiped him, it says. And so we know uh, 
that Mary certainly would have been worshiping Jesus. Um, maybe just enjoying fellowship with him, enjoying relationship with him. And Corel, I think you said last time that we could be sitting at Jesus' feet no matter what we're doing, couldn't we? We, we could just be enjoying our relationship with him, just fellowshipping, um, uh, reverencing him, worshiping him, no matter what we're doing. Any, any other thoughts anyone has on that? Um, we can we can get more insight, can hear what the Lord is saying to us, which direction he wants us to go in. Um, sitting at his feet, he can give us peace about whatever it is that we bring to him. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, he can give us peace. So we we could in we could be serving in sitting at his feet at the same time, couldn't we? We'd have the, the difference in Martha's case, she was troubled by the serving. She was she didn't have the peace that comes from sitting at Jesus' feet and, and resting in him. Getting in insight, as you said, Trish. Um let's see. Oh uh, I want to share something that was in my Oswald Chambers uh, devotional today. I said the one I included this morning was yesterday's devotional from a different, a different devotional. It was kind of related to Mary and Martha. This one today from Oswald Chambers, it's not, he doesn't specifically mention Mary and Martha, but that certainly came to mind when I read it. He said here, one, I'll just read a couple of sentences here says the greatest competitor of devotion to Jesus is service for Jesus. He said we can become so distracted by our service that we're more, we're, we're more devoted to our service than we are to Jesus himself. He said God didn't call us to do something for him. He says we're not sent to battle for God, but we're sent, we're called to be used by God for his purposes. So we're to, to rest in what Christ has done for us. And, and that, that can be a, uh, a trap we can fall into, thinking that it's kind of like what the Galatians fell into. Remember when we studied Galatians was it last year? We can think that our service is, is going to uh, somehow earn favor with God, that we need to serve in order to become more acceptable to God. And it's, it, that's, that's not what he wants us to do. He wants us to rest in what Jesus has done for us, that we have complete acceptance. We, we are righteous. We are right in his sight because of faith in what Jesus has done for us. And in our service flows out of that, out of gratitude. And so then it becomes a joy to serve others. Uh, anybody have anything to add to that? Any insights to share? No. Okay. Um, well, the question we were starting off with tonight was number nineteen. What do we know about Mary? Is there anything else that we need to to know about Mary that we haven't already discussed? Seems like she was always at Jesus' feet, doesn't it? And she wanted to learn. She wanted to learn. Okay, yeah, she wanted. Mm -hmm. Oh, she shared her home. That was the place where he and his disciples went when they needed a place to rest. Okay, she shared her home. Okay, well, actually, both of them did that, didn't they? I think it was actually Martha's home, but they yeah three lived there, so they yeah they both shared their home with Jesus when he needed a place to rest. Anybody else? Seems like she, seems she just wanted to be in his presence. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, there's nothing that's more important to her than, than just being in his presence, was there? Anybody else? Some insights? Uh, it turns out her faith in Jesus was genuine, um, but 
Apparently, she didn't think it could go long distance. Mm, okay. A genuine faith, but she didn't say that again. What well, say it couldn't go long distance? Well, yeah. I mean, when when they, they they were with him and he was doing things, but when he was away from them, then she mm. doubted. Okay, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yes. She, yes, yeah, she was. She always wanted him to be right there, didn't she? She, she had doubts when he was there. Yeah, good point. Yeah, if if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. So, yeah, that's a good point. So, Remember, what does what does that say about us too? When we can't actually physically see Jesus. Yeah. That times and we doubt, you know, and that goes along with our sermons at church right now. God behind the scenes. Mm, yeah. Yeah, good point, Nestor. Yeah, yeah. What does that say about us, our our faith, when we can't see, and we, we can't see Jesus, and we still trust Him? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, was it John chapter? We're blessed. Go ahead. Carol. What'd you say? We're blessed. Think about the, the scripture. Yeah. Mm. Jesus yeah. said that we're blessed because yeah. we don't we don't see, but we still believe. Yeah, I think that's chapter 19 or 20 with with Thomas. Shouldn't you get blessed are those who believe even though they don't see? Yeah, thank you, Carol. But when you think about it, and his presence is where every all of that is. Um, mm -hmm. peace, joy, comfort. Mm -hmm. It's everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what's the scripture says in his presence is fullness of joy? Uh, and his right hand pleasures forevermore. Hmm. I don't recall what that scripture is. That's, um, it's my favorite. Oh, Sounds like a song. Psalm, um, is it 16? Hmm. I say. It might be. Yep, it's sixteen eleven. Okay. So I'm sixteen. I'll have that. Remember that address. Healing. There's everything in there. Hmm. Um, sixteen eleven. Do you want to read it, this, Trish? Uh, yeah. Thou will show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That's the King James Version. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm All right. Thank you, Trish. All right. So let's see. So, yeah, Martha's exit, she was, she left kind of, she left quietly, nobody knowing that she left Mary's, or Mary's. Exit was kind of abrupt, kind of public, because the others followed along. She was a devoted student of Jesus, a devoted disciple, wanted to learn from him. Now, what I didn't, this question wasn't on your list, but how did Jesus' response to Mary differ from his response to Martha? They both said the exact same thing. But if you'll notice, he didn't give them the exact same response. How did he respond to Martha when she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died? Martha's was more like a command. Yeah, it's more like an instruction, right? Like a teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she, there was some... Mary's was more subtle, like more heartfelt. Like... Yeah. yeah, it was more more emotional, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, look how he responded to Mary. He said he saw well, first of all, he saw her weeping. He saw, also saw the Jews that were with her weeping and says he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. That, that word there for deeply moved, it can be 
interpreted a couple of different ways. It can be shake with emotion, uh, agitated. It was the same word that was used in chapter five. Remember when the paralytic was healed at the pool of Bethesda? It says the water, remember the water is stirred up. That's the same word when the water was stirred up. That's the same word here that he was troubled. He was shaken with emotion. It's kind of like agitated, like you think of an agitator in a, in a washing machine. You know, the water is agitated, it's shaken up. That's how the water was in the pool of Bethesda. And that's how Jesus was there. He was, he was agitated. He was uh, deeply troubled. He was moved in spirit. Why, why do you think that was? Why do you think that troubled Jesus so much? I think he was sad that the people he loved had to have the, these type of tragedies and, and, and how it affected them. And he wasn't pleased that, but that's, that's life. But mm -hmm. I think it bothered him to see this tragedy that his, you know, his people had to go through. And since he was fully human, he could feel that. Yeah. He, he could feel how they felt about these tragedies and these really tough times that they go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of sin. That's how we deal with this kind of stuff because of sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think of uh, the Hebrews 4, it says he's able to sympathize with our weakness because he was tempted in every way we were, yet he was without sin, but mm -hmm. experience everything we've experienced so he can sympathize with us. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. Anyone else? He cared because he, he had the human side. Unlike the Greek concept at that time that that God was in, gods were emotion, um, mm -hmm. emotionless, emotionless. Yeah, yeah. I know that's that's something that's well. Maybe you've experienced this, Jim, dealing with uh, you know witnessing to uh, someone like from a Muslim religion. They it's a foreign concept to them that you know that God he could actually have a relationship with God that he that he became a man that he experiences emotions like we do um, you know that's that's foreign to to other religions that, that god can have emotion he can relate to us like that yeah yes yeah, he was he was disturbed in his spirit deeply moved he has compassion for our sufferings it's also in Isaiah 53, remember? It says, um, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with all mm -hmm. of our grief. Mm -hmm. Good one. Yeah, thank you, Trish. He was acquainted with all of our grief. Okay. All right. Um, See, Job 34 says he hears the, the cry of the afflicted. Psalm 6 says the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. Psalm 9, he does not forget the cry of the needy. Psalm 34, the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. His ears are towards their cry for help. Mm -hmm. And of course, the righteous, that's every one of us who's trusted in Jesus. We've received his righteousness as a free gift. So his, his eyes are towards us. His ears are towards our, our cries for help. He's heard the sound of my weeping. All right, question 21. Since Jesus is God and since he is omniscient, he knows everything. Why, why do you think he asked where they laid Lazarus' body in verse 34? Validate their faith oh, through action. Hold on one second, Trish. What was that, Mom? Mm -hmm. To validate their faith through action. Okay. Validate their faith. That's a good answer. Validate their faith through action. He, was, he, he knew where... The, where the body was, didn't he? 
Uh -huh. so, just like remember in the in the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam, "Yeah, where are you, Adam?" Yeah, he knew very well where Adam was. Right? He wanted to hear Adam. He wanted to hear Adam's response. Trish, you had something else to add? Well, no, I was going to say um, the same thing, that he knew where the body was, but to stir up your faith, he asked, where is the body? And okay. then for the unbelievers, they, they would have conspired some more thoughts against it if he would have went directly to it. Okay. So that's why he asked, where is the body? Even though he knew but he still had a plan. He wanted them to believe. Right. Yeah, he wanted them to believe. Okay. So, yeah, so how did they respond then to Jesus' question? Verse, uh, let's see. Uh, I didn't put up the verse there. He said, the Jews said. Oh, yeah, they did. Okay, I'm sorry. No. I didn't put the verse here. Yeah, so what did they, how did they respond then? Verse 34. I've got to come and see. You come and see. Hey. hey. Oh my. Bless you. And then verse 35, of course, that's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we know that, that Jesus, that we know that God does experience emotion. He sympathizes with us. Luke 15, remember with the prodigal son, how the father expressed emotion over his loss when he returned. We know from Ephesians 4.30, the Holy Spirit can be grieved. You can experience the emotion of grief. Thessalonians 5, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So what was the response of the Jews when they saw Jesus weeping? What did what were their thoughts? How he loved them. See how he loved them. That, that would have been an expression of love. That they were they were probably wailing. Is that a, wasn't that a custom back then when someone died, they would make loud wailings? Uh -huh. He saw Jesus weeping. He, in the conclusion, he, he loved them. And I, I have no problem believing that because of that culture, that, that he used that moment to prove that he loved them and to engage them mm. so that he could get their attention because he was there for a mission. He had a mission. Mm. That's a good point. That's a good point. He didn't just go in there and... and out off cold hard facts that's a good point jim he was able to relate to them so they uh empathize with them so they would be perhaps be more receptive to what he said good point i hadn't had to give that any thought they would stop wailing they would go with him to the body and that would set the, the stage for what jesus was about to do yeah yeah good insight Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so in verse 38, again, he's displaying emotion. It says he's, again, he was deeply moved with him. Came to the tomb. It said it was, a, it was a cave and there was a stone lying against it. Of course, we know when Jesus, when he was buried, he would have probably been a similar tomb. There was a there was a stone rolled against his tomb as well. So the stone rolled against it. Verse 39, Jesus said, remove the stone. This was four days, so there was no doubt by this time about Lazarus' death. Martha certainly... Knew he was dead. So by this time, there's going to be a stench. It's been four days. Verse 
Um, why do you think Jesus asked the people to roll away the stone? Couldn't he have done that himself or couldn't he have called down a legion of angels? Well, when, when a person or people are involved, they feel invested in the event or in whatever is taking place. You're a part of it and you take it far more special than if you have nothing to do with it. Yeah, that's a good point. You, you wanted them to be involved in this. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. If you're just, if you're just watching it, it wouldn't be nearly as meaningful, but if you're actually participating in it, it would have a lot more meaning. Yeah, yeah thanks. Kind of like, kind of like in, a, in a church, let's say you attend a church. If you do nothing, I mean, all you do is go in, sit down, listen, get up and leave. Mm -hmm. You don't feel near a part of it unless you, let's say you're a part of the choir, you have a Bible study or you're on the prayer team or whatever, anything you feel. Mm -hmm a part of it yeah. and you love it more you love it more i just anyway yeah no that's that's great insight yeah and they're going to move the stone away themselves they could see the dead body okay there, there was a verification that nothing had happened beyond what they already knew okay oh well, that's that's another good point yeah they couldn't accuse him of uh, some kind of sleight of hand, you know, some magic trick. Oh, that, you know, it's his twin brother or something like that. I hadn't thought about that one either. Okay. So they could be eyewitnesses. Pardon me, Trey. That they believed that he was dead, that he was truly dead. See that he was truly dead? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, so, yeah, this is probably a little bit of a stretch, but something that came to mind last evening when I was reading this was uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I don't think this is, there's really any tie-in, but it, it, just, it still came to mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, um, let's see. says that it, he has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, which is the, the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written in letters engraved on stones, came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look on his face, uh, the face of Moses, I, I, I don't know, it's just... Uh, It, we're, we're ministers of the new covenant now. We're not ministers of the old covenant that's written on stone that was a ministry of death. The, the old covenant, you know, we're to rule away that stone, so to speak, of the, of the law that people are under. God wants us involved in presenting this new covenant of grace to get people out of that old covenant of the law written on stones. And again, I'm, you know, this is, stretch tying these together but it just came to mind you know god wants us involved in the process of people being raised to life spiritually god's the one that has to do it because he we're involved right we're sharing the gospel the gospel of grace to get people out of that uh ministry of death which is the law commandments written on stone um so that they can come alive by putting faith in jesus but whatever, more that's good. Um, and we're to share the gospel of grace. People are saved by trusting that Jesus Christ for every sin, and that trusting in Him, we become righteous. Not by not by keeping the, the law. We can't ever make ourselves righteous. We can't ever bring ourselves alive through the law. Remember in Galatians, it said if if uh, if righteousness, if there was if there was a law that could provide life and righteousness would come through the law, but the law can't give us life. Only Jesus can give us life. So what that's mm -hmm. worth. All righty. <clears throat>
So anyway, so I wanna, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I kind of understand uh, what you were saying through that scripture. It brought a scripture to my mind um, while you were talking about it. It came to my mind too that I think kind of ties in with what you were saying in 2 Corinthians um, 5, 14 and 21. Mm -hmm. Behold, old it's things are passed away. away. Mm -hmm. And all things are new. Yeah. So we're new creations in Christ. Our flesh is dead. Well, Amen. Amen, yeah. Spiritually, we're born again. Amen. Yeah, and this is... A picture of Lazarus being raised from the dead is is a picture of us being raised from the dead spiritually, isn't it? We were, like mm -hmm. you said, Trish, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We became alive together with Christ. So, yeah, it's, that's a good tie-in as well. Thank you, Trish. That right underneath is what I was thinking of right after that, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Mm, yeah. This means that anyone, yeah, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, like she said, and the new life has begun. Amen. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Him, so through Christ, and God has given us the task of reconciling people to Him. Amen. Amen. And don't forget verse 19. We were reconciled. God. Amen. Yeah. For God was in Christ, yeah, reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting, no longer counting people's sins against him. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's how we were reconciled. Exactly. When we believed it, trusted in him, we became a new creation. Forgiven and declared righteous. Gifted with the perfect righteousness of Christ. All right. Um, so, yeah, God wants us involved with the process when, when he's making people alive again. But can I, add, can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Well, not that I've been asking questions all night, but can I just make another statement? Certainly. So with the rolling away of the stone, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be pointing to Jesus' death? Like when they, they rolled away the stone, his body was mm -hmm. in there. They wanted to see, the disciples wanted to see, was mm -hmm. he still there? Doesn't I, that relate to his death? I would think well, so. Serial. Because he just got done saying, I am the resurrection and the life, right? Mm -hmm. he, and he's going to show, show you, I am the resurrection and the life. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. From dead and a week later, he's going to do the same thing. He's going to die. He's going to write uh -huh. from the dead. So, yeah, it's good insight, Trish. He's just giving them a, a one-week preview. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Trish. Um, I, well, this is kind of a rabbit trail, but I just had a note here. Um, when Jesus, when his... Uh, when he was resurrected, the stone was rolled away by the angels. Remember, it, it was a great earthquake. Okay. Angels rolled away. There wasn't any people there. Um, there were so there were, there were angels that attended to Jesus at his birth. There, there were angels that attended at his temptation when he was in the wilderness being tempted. There were angels attended to him at his agony in the uh, in the garden. And also angels there at his resurrection, but there were no angels attending to him when, when he was hanging on the cross and receiving the, the God's wrath on our behalf. I thought that was interesting. Because uh -huh. he had to endure the, the wrath of God on our behalf, all the punishment that our sins deserved. So now the angels worship him for all eternity, and so will we. Amen. All right. So verse, yeah, question 29, verse 29. Why did Mary object to Jesus' request to roll away the stone? The stench. The stench, right? Plus, this is the, the, the rotting corpse of a loved one, right? This is her brother that you know, uh, has to see your loved one's rotting corpse. 
dug up. It's going to be a stench. The body's rotten. And so what was Jesus' response? Verse 30. I'm sorry, question 30, verse 39 to 40. Verse, verse four. Didn't I say, if you would believe, you should see the glory of God. Yeah, didn't I just get done saying? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Dad, did you have something to add? No. Okay. It's something to add. All right. So they removed the stone. Let's see, where am I? Verse question 31, verse 41. So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes. Said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. So why did he pray out loud? Why didn't he pray just pray silently? He prayed because he wanted the people to believe that God sent him. Yeah. He said, I know you. Hear me. How do you put that? He said, I knew you heard me, but because of these people standing around, I wanted them to believe that you, that you sent me. So he wanted to make sure everybody knew that this was something that God was doing, didn't, didn't he? He wanted them to believe that God the Father sent him, believe that he is the Son of God. And his father sent him. Jim, there's something interesting there, too. In, uh, ooh, let's see, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says that there's only one mediator between us and the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's, this would make that pretty clear, wouldn't it? Yeah, amen. One mediator. Yeah, thank you. All right. Look at verse 40, though. When Jesus says, didn't I tell you that you would see the glory, you would see God's glory if you believe. Mm, yeah. That right there just lets us know how much God wants to do for us mm. when we believe him. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That just stood out to me just now when I was looking at it. Yeah. It wants us to see his glory. Like he wants to do it. He's, he's telling us he wants to do so much for us. Mm -hmm. But we just have to believe. Yeah. But he's, he, he's always doing things for us anyway. But with regard to us believing in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean... It, isn't that, uh, I don't know, that, that, that's all he really asks of, isn't it? Just to, just to believe him, just to trust him. And isn't that what, mm -hmm. uh, what a father wants for their children? You know, just trust me, right? Mm -hmm. Me that uh -huh. I know what's best. Jesus I even said it um, in another, I can't remember if it was nine or ten, where he said that he just wants you to believe in the one who sent him. Yeah, amen. Yeah, and you trust me. I mean, believe in the believe in the one who he sent. I'm sorry. Mm, okay, believe in the one who he sent. Yeah. yeah. And then even Trish said it. The, um, I don't remember if it's Mark where you said. I can't remember exactly where it is, but I remember her bringing it up and just saying how he couldn't perform miracles at a certain place because they wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't remember yeah, the scripture on the book. Yeah, that was in Mark. Um, it was in another uh, chapter too. While I go ahead and finish, and I'll just um, I'll think about it. It'll come back to me. I don't know. That just makes me feel like so much that he wants to do so much for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to find that. Where did he take them to? It was his disciples. He took them uh, to a place where they served idols. It was all idols there in that little town. Where was it? 
he wanted them to believe. He was trying to show them supernaturally and they didn't understand. Oh, Matthew. Matthew 13, 58. Yeah. Probably yeah. somewhere Thank else, you. too. Yeah. I think it was after you said the 5,000. Was it 13? 16. I don't know. Well, the part where I was saying he didn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. That's that's where I said the Matthew 13 one. Matthew 13, 58. Yeah, I yeah, said so he, he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Yeah. Well, and remember the reason that he did the miracles was see in John chapter 20. The reason is so that we would know that he is the Messiah. He is the son of God. And by believing we have life in his name. So if we're not going to believe, why would he even bother doing these miracles? It, you know, it's like cat throwing uh, pearls to swine. Mm -hmm. Not going to be receptive. No sense uh, doing the miracles. Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, so um, verse 43, I, I didn't really have a question there, but he... Uh, he says he cried out with a loud voice. Why? Why? why okay, I'm, I'll turn it into a question. Why did he cry out with a loud voice? What? Uh, what? Why do you think? Why? Why did he have to do this with a loud voice? Who? Who do you think he was talking to? Well, he told them he was going to wake Lazarus up, so he had to yell. <laughs> I want to think about that. <laughs> that was a good one. I was just thinking he wanted everybody around him to hear. I, I think so. Him, but that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I think it was as much for the benefit of those around, don't you? Same reason he prayed out loud to the Father, I, I'm, uh -huh. that they they would know that you sent me. So now I'm yelling. Not for, he. I don't think he would had to. I don't think he would had to yell to Lazarus. I, but I think it was for the benefit of everyone else. Like, hey, I'm calling Lazarus out now. Yeah, it's for the benefit. So that you know, so that you might believe that the Father, God, the Father sent me. And I see the whole thing as a teaching lesson, because a week later he was going to rise the same way. Amen. Only then he wouldn't have to engage someone to roll the stone away. Mm -hmm. The power of God blew it away. Yeah. Amen. All the cords that held that huge rock in place, they yeah. found way away from the site proving that there was more power there than what man could handle. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I think you're right that this is a, a picture. He's just giving them a vivid picture of what's going to happen a week later. Mm -hmm. uh, and look at all his, you know, the parables. Or, parable is an earthly story that, that gives a spiritual lesson, right? And now he's giving them a living parable. This is, mm -hmm. this is, this is more than just words. I'm going to show you. What's going to happen a week from now? Mm -hmm. uh, he showed them that he could identify with their pain and their hurt and their deep trouble, right? Mm, true. Yeah. And <clears throat> he's telling us we're going to go through trouble and we're going to be separated. Yet nothing. He showed that even death cannot separate us. Mm. Even though we've been separated by death, he's even overcome that. Mm -hmm. No matter what we go through that separates us for a period, <clears throat> someday mm -hmm. he's, even, he's going to overcome it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. that, that gives us comfort when a, when a loved one 
passes away and goes to be with the Lord, doesn't it? If they're in Christ, we know we're going to see them again. We're only going to be separated for a short period of time. Yep. Also, um, I want to add to what your dad was saying. Jesus also, before he, he showed his humanity to the people before his divinity. And it brought me to thinking about um, Jesus's transfiguration. You know, he was with his disciples all that time, showing his humanity. And then he took them up to the Mount of Transfiguration. So they would believe that he was, he was God, that he was divine. Mm -hmm. And what this made me think, like the same thing, he's almost doing the same thing here in, in John 11. Mm -hmm. Through his resurrection, when he told Martha, I am the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He's the way, he's the life, he's the truth, the door. Amen. And do, he, I read something about his statement, I am the resurrection. And it was talking about how Martha did believe, but she didn't, she believed, but she, her insight wasn't far out. She only saw his death, her brother's death. And then Jesus was trying to teach her, trying to get her to see that I am the resurrection through relationship with me because I am the life. Mm. And I was like, wow, okay. I never looked at it like that. Mm. Um, you know, it's important that uh, he's coming back for us. And uh, we have to remember that six days later after Lazarus was resurrected, he was killed. And he had promised that when he was crucified, he would come back in three days. So it's only a week after this Lazarus being raised from the dead that he was crucified, and then three days later, as he promised, he came back. Mm -hmm. So he came twice, didn't he? He came once to uh, teach us for 30, for three years and died at 33. But then he came the second time when he was resurrected, and now he promises that he will come again. Mm -hmm. So his word is good, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. Take it to the bank. Mm -hmm. Let God be true and every man a liar. Mm -hmm. Let Hebrews 6 say it's impossible for God to lie. That's right. All right. Sorry about that. My battery was going dead. All right. Um, okay, another question there. Question, question 33. Why did he tell the people to unbind Lazarus? Verse 44. Cried out for loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. When he died, came forth. He was bound hand and foot with wrappings. His face was wrapped around with him. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. What's the significance of that? That he's free. Set him free from the law. <laughs> well, there you go. Set him free from the law. Okay. The law of death. It could be a picture of that. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. We were bound by the law, bound by legalism. Who the sun set free is free indeed. Amen. Yeah. And again, God wants us involved in that process, doesn't he? Uh -huh. Go out and share that, share that gospel of grace. The people can be set free from the, from the bondage. The bondage that the false teachers wanted to keep us under, keeping us bound to these rules and regulations, thinking that that's what would make us acceptable to in God's sight. Jesus came to set us free. And as Trish said, the sun sets free is free indeed. 
Well, you know, you just made the point because uh, 2 Corinthians th chapter 3 says that the law is the ministry of death. Yeah. Amen. So Jim nailed it again. Yeah. Amen. That was the other scripture you put on there. Pardon me, Carol? I'm sorry. I was just saying, yeah, I was agreeing with, with um, your dad. And oh. thinking about that scripture that you mm. added earlier. That was one of them. Mm. I, I just said it out loud, though. Yeah. Okay. No, it's good. <laughs> yeah, the law was a ministry of death. And the reason it was a ministry of death is because we couldn't keep it. The, the, the law says if you, uh, the wages of sin is death. So if we can't keep it perfectly, we're going to die. And that's every one of us. We're, die, we're dead. And Jesus came to give us life. All right. So God wants us to be involved in setting the captives free, wants us to loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the heavy burden. Now I'm quoting from Isaiah 58. We're to undo the heavy burden, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. The, the scribes, the false teachers, the religious leaders kept a, 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 local bond, a, a local bondage, a yoke of bondage. On the yoke of bondage on them, so we're to break that yoke, set the captives free. Of course, Jesus is the one that really sets them free, but we're to share that message when they believe it, is when they are set free. All right. And that's why he wanted them to uh, unbind him so they could see. That he was actually dead. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they would have been familiar with those grave clothes, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Interesting, similar to what, remember what they, what they found? Well, we'll see it in a couple chapters, actually about eight more, eight or nine more chapters when we see when, when Jesus is resurrected. We'll see that he has the grave clothes and also mm -hmm. mentioned there the a cloth wrapped around his face and uh -huh. we'll see that Jesus when his when that, that cloth that was around his face was was neatly folded in the tomb yes and that mm. be some significance to that as well yes it is all right so he was bound hand and foot with wrappings his face wrapped around the cloth unbind him and let him go so, here's a reminder. Um, let's see now. So it says here that many of the Jews believed in Jesus. Why do you think that is? Well, the evidence was pretty overwhelming. You, you sure would think so, wouldn't you? You, you think everything. It's all with their own eyes. Saw it with their own eyes. Believed. Saw it and believed. Does it surprise you that not all of them believed? Uh -uh. Not really. Yeah. It, it, I, yeah. I mean, initially you think, well, what, you know, everybody, you think everybody would believe, but, you know, ha having shared the gospel with people and being, and been rejected, I, you know, it's, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes you just have to shake your head how someone wouldn't believe that. But I guess we were all in that same boat for a while, took, took a while before we believed. If they didn't reject him, they'd have to, that would prove that they were wrong. They weren't going to admit that. <clears throat> that that's a good point. Our, our pride, we don't, we don't like to be proven wrong. Yeah, some of them. It'd, it'd be easy for them at the moment to do that because they didn't know what was coming. Hmm. Meaning, in a week from now, with, with yeah, the... because at this point, they haven't they haven't really gelled in their mind the fact that this is bigger than what they can see. Yeah. So denial would have been simple. That, that's that's a good point. Yeah, they don't they don't know that. 
Jesus is going to the cross a week, in a week from now. They don't have the benefit that we have. That's a good point. Yeah, so let's see. So many believed. They, they saw what Jesus did. They believed in him. But some did not. Some, what did they do? The ones that did not believe. Verse 46. Jim, 46, verse 46 shows something. It proves something interesting. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were Jews. So were the disciples that were there. Mm -hmm. So they were, uh, they were a friendly clique. They were all <clears throat> of one mind. And it says in verse 46, some of them went to the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees weren't there. He didn't have any adversaries there. This was a friendly group. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, they, yeah, they were all friends. They came to console Mary and Martha, right? So they were friends. But some of them did not believe, and they went back to the Pharisees. Told them the things that Jesus had done. So if they were a friendly group, what, why would they go to the Pharisees? I guess the ones that didn't believe wanted to be the tattletales. <laughs> Even though they were friendly, they probably were still, I guess, felt beholden to the Pharisees. They would have been the authorities, right? The they were like... Like the rhinos today in political, uh, uh, they're <laughs> Republicans who pretend to be conservatives and are not. They're called rhinos. Mm -hmm. and that's sort of what they were here, I guess. Mm -hmm. They were pretending to be friends. Or they could have been gen. Well, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. They maybe they were genuine friends, but they still were holding to the teachings of the Pharisees. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's kind of speculation, but they obviously felt some obligation to the Pharisees, didn't they? At least some of them did. They they knew. But doesn't that make you think? Like, sorry. Now go ahead, Trish. Doesn't that make you think back to what chapter was that? Eight. The blind man that was healed. And that was chapter nine. How they, chapter nine, and they didn't want the family didn't want to be ostracized. Oh, that's true. So maybe that's what maybe that's what these friends were doing. They didn't want to be ostracized or kicked out. That could be. So they went back. Could be. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would have been important to a Jew not to be uh, kicked out of the synagogue, right? Uh huh. That's your salvation, be, being, uh, being a, a Jew, being a child of Abraham, and following the law. I guess that would be pretty important to you. So that's a, that's a good insight, Trish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, why don't we pick up there next time? Well, maybe some of us will be given a little more insight on that. We'll. Uh, there's a couple more points to be made on that. So we'll pick up again on question 35. Why did some not believe? There's, I think there's a little more we can discuss on that. So what can we, what are our takeaways for tonight? What, how can we apply that this for this week? So no matter what, no matter what we face, Jesus, there's nothing that we go through ever that he hasn't already been touched with. He is mm. the high priest of our confession. Mm. So as we sit at his feet and we bring to him our woes and worries at his world, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. If we just sit at his feet and, and talk to him, listen to him, continue in praise and worship and prayer, 
but the main thing is keeping keeping yourselves plugged in ourselves plugged in to Jesus because he's the life he gave us his life that we may live mm -hmm. it abundantly through him if we disconnect from that we won't have that abundant joy and peace and all the other good stuff right <laughs> all right thanks Trish all that other good stuff uh -huh. all right thank you Trish anybody else anything any other takeaways we can he is definitely a god who cares for sure yep you should remember Romans chapter 8 too when he started out by saying there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Mm. He went on to say that he works everything for good for those who love him. Mm. And then who can separate us from the love of Christ? Mm. He's found not always taken to the third heaven and he was convinced when he came back that there was nothing in heaven above Earth below, all creation, nothing in life, nothing in death that could ever separate a believer. Mm. That's right. Love of God through Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen. Amen. He wants to hear from us. I mean, he he longs to hear from us. Mm -hmm. He wants us to talk to him and just pour it all out yeah yeah sure great would somebody like to close in prayer i will thank you trish heavenly father thank you for just allowing us to meet in your presence once again tonight lord as we leave we just Ask, Lord, that you bring back to remembrance all that you have spoken to us, that we may continue to walk in your wisdom and your knowledge and your truth, that your words may continually sanctify our minds, our hearts, our spirits, and our souls. In Jesus' name, we praise you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Trish. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the good insights. Thank you. All right. See y'all next Monday, Lord willing. Okay. Where's Kim? Did you say uh, Lord willing? Oh, I said see y'all next Monday, Lord willing. And so oh, okay. where Kim is. I don't know. I sent oh here we go. I just got a reply. Let's see what she said. Uh she can't make it. Okay. <laughs> bye, Kim. Bye, Trish. Bye. Trish. I thought she would. Good night. Bye. Yeah, she's in Florida now. Uh oh. That's what I said. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I remember her saying I'm in Florida. I'm yeah. going to Florida. But I didn't know exactly when. Yes. She might be right sitting here. under a palm tree listening to us. She, she <laughs> might be. Yeah. <laughs> she well, if that's the case, there, all of you are then. If that's the case. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> All sitting under palm trees. I, I was under a palm tree today. Yeah. Who are you? Hey, don't feel too bad, girls. Uh, Doris took a picture of me scraping ice off of our windshield. Yeah, we were scraping ice this morning and wearing shorts this afternoon. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there was no ice in Pennsylvania. No, there wasn't. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, we'll see y'all. We'll see y'all some sometime next Monday, hopefully. Bye. Bye. -bye. All right. See you, Jess. Bye, Jess. Bye, Jim. Bye, everyone. See you, Jess. Bye, bye. Bye, Jess.